Our lesson this morning comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. As we think about godly motivation. Now there are motivations in our lives that move us to do certain things. I remember when I was about 15 years old, we were getting ready to go on a family vacation, which meant I got to ride in the back at some point of a very large station wagon. I'm sure many of us have done that or have been there. We've either been in the back or we've been the ones driving it. But we've been in that situation. And that summer before, or that spring before, we had our family vacation and went out and got my very first job. Ironically, it's my favorite one to look back on it because it didn't involve a restaurant kitchen. But we went out and I was working for a, a man who had a, a, a nursery there. He had flowers and, and all types of things there in his, behind his house as his nursery, his plant nursery and those types of things. And so we'd go out, we'd do weeding, we'd plant uh, things and we'd split the, the flowers for the big sale he had because my motivation was the purchase at that time, a long time ago, a portable CD player. Now some of you may not even know what that is, but you really want to have your mind blown and go ask your dad or your granddad what an 8-track is and he'll blow your mind. Because we think about those portable CD players, back in the day that was our iPod, so to speak. And I worked all summer long and got just enough to be able to purchase that. And as soon as I did, well, I quit that job. Because that was my entire motivation was for that one item. Now think about this today. What about godly motivation? What encourages us, what moves us to do things that are pleasing to God? Look at, look at, at it with me here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 through 11. He says here, therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing, now notice, not to men, he says, but to Him. Our desire in this life is not to please men, though we don't set out to upset people, but our number one goal is to be pleasing to God. He says, for we, for we, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. That is the motivation to be pleasing to God. Because we will stand before the Son of God and be judged on what we have done. He says in verse 11, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. We know the terror of the Lord. As we look throughout the, the, throughout, look throughout the Bible, we find the wrath of God against evil, against the ungodly, against the rebellious, against those who have given up on God, we find that numerous times throughout the Bible. And Paul says here, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. To do what? We'll look again at verse 9. To be well pleasing to Him. We persuade men, that is mankind, to be well-pleasing to God. We encourage people using the Word of God to make themselves right with God. That is our motivation. Now you think about this. Do people always do things for the right reason? Do people always do things for the right reason? No, they don't. Sometimes people do things because they want to make someone feel bad. They do things because they want to make themselves feel good. They do things to try to make themselves appear good and noble or whatever reason before others. So do people always do things for the right reason? The answer is no. Do, do we want to follow God? You know, believe it or not, there are those who when their friend or their family member comes forward, as we'd like to say, to respond in some type of way, that they also go because they want to do the same thing. They want to be like them and do what they do. That's not godly motivation. And that's not following God, just following what someone else has done. We must have the right motives behind everything that we do, including following God. Today, when we look at some things, we're going to look at some things to consider about motivation and when it is godly and when it is not. We begin by looking at unrighteous motivation. Unrighteous motivation. This begins, I know no better place to, to begin than with selfishness. Selfishness 
is an unrighteous thing we find in people's motivation today. Look at Acts 20 and verse 30. He says, Also from among yourselves men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. There are those today, when I read this verse, I think about how there are those today who want to make their names well known. And there's nothing wrong with working and laboring for the Lord and someone recognizing who you are, knowing your name because maybe there's some things you've written or they've heard your lessons. Those things are not bad. But then there are those, who, their whole point in their work is to make sure people know who they are. Look there at Acts 20 and verse 30. you think they didn't want some people following after them for a selfish reason? Absolutely. In fact, during the ministry of Christ, people despised Christ because they were following after Christ and not following after their traditions. Do people today get upset when you abandon family traditions to follow God? Yes. Do people get upset? Do your friends get upset when you abandon the things you've always done because you realize, you know what, this isn't pleasing to God, you need to stop it. Do they get upset when you stop doing what you've done for so long? See, when we change things, people get upset. Self-promotion is the idea that we want people to follow us and do what we do and know our names so we can become great, as someone say, in the brotherhood. We shouldn't see, set out to become great in the brotherhood, should we? We should set out to become great and to become faithful before God. That's what the Bible tells us to do. That's what Paul said. He said, I want to be well-pleasing to Him. Was he well-pleasing to other people? No, people hated him. That's why he got beat. That's why he got stoned. That's why he got you know, all these things shipwrecked and imprisoned because people did not like Paul. Because he used to be Saul, didn't he? He used to be the man who persecuted the church. But when he met Christ on the road to Damascus, his motivation changed, didn't it? It changed. Look at John chapter 12, verses 42 and 43. Here the Bible says, Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For the love of praise of men more than the praise of God. Isn't that still true today? People love to have others talk well of them. Now we understand in proper context, that's not a bad thing. Someone says something nice about you, hey, thanks, that's, that's pretty nice of you. But the idea here is they thrived on it. They lived for that praise of men. And the Bible says so in there in verse 43, they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Now we ask the question, how do we know that? Because they wouldn't even confess that, that Christ was the Son of God. As we said in verse 42, even the rulers believed in Him, but they wouldn't confess. Why? Because they were cowards and selfish and loved men more. Is that still true today? Every day we see that. What about wealth? Is wealth a selfish motivator? Look at 1 Peter 5 and verse 2. Here, speaking of shepherds, as we know sometimes we refer to them as elders. Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. There are those today who will do anything to earn a buck, won't they? And sometimes it's not a very straightforward, honest, upright thing, is it? So we use the term, is this legitimate? How many of you have ever gotten a phone call from someone who realized this is a what? This is a fake call. This is a, you know, a, a sham. This is not real what they're trying to get me to do, right? If you send us $1,000, you'll make 10 right? That works out so often. We find here what? Dishonest gain, selfishness, money is not a motivator to godliness. It shouldn't be. We think about all those who have done so much for the kingdom, and so many times wealth never entered into it. They're the same ones who they have such low income, their children have, can actually apply for free lunches. People say, well, they make so much money. You know, preachers, they get all this money coming in. They just beg for money, all this stuff. That's not always the case. 
Now, some of those so-called on television we see, oh, we could t talk about that for days, but true gospel preachers, that's not always the case. You know, we're, talking about, we're not talking about it's sinful for men to make money and to earn a wage, but there are those who seek out just to be extremely wealthy, and that's their only motivator. And it's referred to here in 1 Peter 5 and verse 2 as some of these men were doing things for dishonest gain. What about this idea of unrighteous motivation? Quantity. Quantity. But we can do, we can get more. More what? More people? We can get more money coming in. Think about the word quantity and how that could be used in a Unrighteous, as an unrighteous motivator. The whole counsel, as we look in Acts 20 and verse 27, the whole counsel of God brings in whole believers. That is, it brings in those who have heard the whole truth and they believe what the Bible says. Acts 20 and verse 27, Paul says, For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God, meaning I didn't hold anything back because I thought you'd be offended. I told you everything. The whole counsel of God of God. And so when those individuals heard what Paul was speaking, they heard everything. They heard about baptism. They heard about those who were leading people astray. They heard about marriage and divorce and all those types of things. He told them everything that they were to be told because why? As an inspired man of God, he would be condemned for doing so, but also as a Christian, he would be condemned for doing so if he held anything back. He says, For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. We cannot be those who pervert the gospel in an attempt to appeal to crowds. Look at Galatians 1, verses 6 and 7. He says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another but there are some who trouble you who want to pervert the gospel of Christ. You ever been talking to someone you think, okay, if I tell them this, they're really not going to like it. Do you go ahead and tell them? Paul did. Christ did. You know, when Christ went to the temple, as you read about there in the gospel accounts, and they were selling doves and all these things, they say, well, if I get on to them, they're really not going to like me. No, the Bible says he fastened a whip and he drove them out. Why? Because they were doing things that were wrong. We look here at Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. He tells us what they're... He, he's amazed. He's marveling. They're moving away from the gospel of Christ so quickly to something else. He says in verse 7, which is not another, but there are some... Now notice, there are some who trouble you and want to pervert, that is what? Change... The gospel of Christ. They were changing it. Why does someone change the gospel? Why are there so-called churches down the street? Because you can find whatever you want. You drive, far, drive long enough, far enough, you'll find someone to tell you something that you like, and hey, they'll come on in. And so we'll pick quantity over quality, true, honest, sincere believers in the Word of God. A selfish motivation can come in a for, in a, or unrighteous motivation can come in the form of desiring quantity over honesty and quality. John 12 and verse 43, for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. When we think about our motivation, are we doing something because we want to be pleasing to God and bring honor and glory to Him? Or are we doing it because we want to bring honor and glory to ourselves? One is righteous, one is not. What about righteous motivation? Well, that begins with striving for the righteous path, doesn't it? We strive for the righteous path. Luke chapter 13 and verse 24. He says, strive to enter through the narrow gate. He tells us which way to go in this life. Our motivation should go down the path that leads us to eternal life. Our motivation is to get to heaven, isn't it? Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Why? Because their motivation pushes them towards the wide gate that leads to destruction. Our motivation has to be to be pleasing to God. 
It has to be to be pleasing to God. We strive for the righteous path. But also notice this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 3 and 4. Striving for righteousness also includes the idea of not putting up with falsehood. It's one thing to preach and teach the gospel. It's another to stand up against those things which will lead people straight to hell if they follow it. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, verses 3 and 4 says, By fear, lest somehow as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For he who comes, for if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you'll be, you may well put up with it. We do not want to put up with falsehood. That's what we find there in verse 3. It says, I fear lest somehow you're deceived and you what? You put up with that. Look at verse 15 of the same chapter. Therefore it is no great thing if, he, if his ministers, that is Satan's ministers, also transform themselves to the ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their works. There are those who have the appearance of a gospel preacher. But their words deceive them. That's what he's talking about. Listen to what they say and look up what they say. One of the reasons these verses are on the screen isn't just to help you and to keep up. It's also so you can see exactly what we're talking about. Because the Bible is warning us to, do, to not put up with falsehood. And instead, as we saw in Luke 13, verse 24, to strive to enter by that narrow gate that leads us to heaven. Because the other gate will not. The other gate will not. Look at Jude, verse 3. He says, Beloved, I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. He's saying, I wanted to write to you to exhort one another about our common salvation. Instead, I said, I better encourage you to contend earnestly for what? For the one singular faith. Because why? He wanted to make sure they were grounded in it. You notice before they exhort one another in common salvation. You want to make sure that it's, that it's actually the common salvation. He's not going to exhort them through often error. Therefore, he encourages them to do what? To contend earnestly for the singular faith. Before you can encourage someone in faith, you've got to make sure they're actually in the faith. That's what Jude was talking about. Again, he wanted to write to them concerning their common salvation, but instead he, wanted, he had to write to them to contend earnestly for the faith, to fight and to defend the true faith. So one righteous motivation is to strive for the righteous path. Another is strive to be approved by God, not necessarily by men. We should strive to be approved of by God. That is who matters. You don't disappoint people all the time. Not because not necessarily because you make a mistake, though men do. But because we, when we want to follow the Bible, there are going to be those who simply do not like it. It's offensive. We live in a world today where everybody is offended by everything. Just a few weeks ago, I saw where the, remember the animal crackers, and you had the cage on the, on the front with the animals in it? You know they had, had to remove that cage because they wanted them to look like they're free. They're not even real. That's how offended our world is today. We need to get back to reality. We need to make sure that we're not, offense, uh, not offensive to God. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 in verse 15. Be diligent, present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Present yourself approved to God. Everybody else will either fall, fall in behind you and follow that godly example, or they won't, but you be approved of by God. A worker who does not need to be ashamed. There is no shame in being a student of the Word of God. We're not talking about a preaching student. We're talking about a person who reads and studies the Word of God. That's a student of the Bible. And there is no shame in being a student of the Bible. That's what he's talking about there in verse 15. A worker who does not need to be ashamed. Rightly dividing. Because why? Because they are striving to be approved of by God. They can therefore rightly divide the word of truth. And there is no shame in such things. 
We do not want to be disqualified. We want to be approved. Paul warned of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 27. When he says, But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. He's saying what? I practice what I preach. Unless when I go and preach to someone else, I'm disqualified because why? I'm a hypocrite. I'm a liar. I'm a fraud. And I am, as he says, disqualified. We practice what we preach and what we teach. Professing to know God or to be a Christian does not automatically qualify a person before God. Look at Titus 1 and verse 16. He says, they profess to know God, but in works they deny Him. You catch that? They say they know God, but in their works, we might say in their life, they deny Him every single day. Being an abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. Saying you know God and knowing God are two different things. Saying you're a Christian and actually being one is a different thing. You know, as he says there, they profess to know God. You ever have someone tell you they're a Christian? And before the conversation is over, you realize they're not a Christian. By their language, by their subject matter. He says they profess to know God, but in their works, in works they deny Him. Being abominable, being disobedient, and therefore what? Disqualified for every good work. We do not want to be like that. Some lessons for us today. Godly, godly, let's say right, godly motivation in, includes selflessness. Godly motivation includes selflessness. Selfless. It means we're not the most important thing in our lives. You hear someone say, me, myself, and I, what they mean is themselves, not no one else. Godly motivation includes selflessness, giving glory to God for all things. First, First Peter 4, verse 11, he says, If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God, it means you speak where God has spoken. If anyone ministers, let him do as, as with the ability which God supplies, then all things, what? In all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Man is not mentioned as receiving the glory there, only God, and rightfully so. God is the one who should be glorified in all things that we do. We help those who are in need, God gets the glory. We reach out to the lost, God gets the glory. We accomplish some task, some other task, task for the church, God gets the glory. Why? Because He deserves it. Isn't He worthy of it? God gets the glory. Blessings of God should be recognized by the selfless. As you look at James chapter 1 and verse 17, when He tells us every good gift and every perfect gift is what? Is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. I mean, He's not going anywhere. And all those blessings come from Him. People say, well, i got my own job. How do you think he got that job? Through education? Through hard work? Through your ability to buy a car? You get to work? All stems back to God. Because, friends, our first, first breath every morning, it belongs to God. And so does the second one and the third one. Everything else, everything we have in this life, belongs to God because it came from God. We see there in verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. It's interesting that so many times man has the faults of saying, well, I've earned all this, and when bad things happen, we say, well, why is God doing this to me? We never gave me any glory in the first place, but now it's His fault? When bad things happen? No, that doesn't work. Every good gift comes from Him. Hardships are a part of life. But God is always there. In Him there is no variation or shadow of turning. He does not move. Godly motivation includes righteous motives. Godly motivation includes righteous motives. We must be zealous for things that edify. 
things that encourage. Look at 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 12. Even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual, spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church. You notice there the glory still doesn't go to the person. As we're talking about here he's, in context, he's talking about spiritual gifts during their time period. Not for us today. But even during that time, he says what? You don't get the glory. The edification, the encouragement still went to who? To the church. Ultimately, to God. Not to you. Everything we do must be done to edify God. And to edify others and to the glory must go to God. We were created, after all, for good and godly works, as we find in Ephesians 2 and verse 10. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Walk in what? Good works. We are His workmanship. Everything we do goes back to God. He gives us the blessings and we give Him the glory. Because He is worthy of it. You think about godly motivation. The Christian must always do things with the proper motivation. If our motivation is wrong, it doesn't matter what we do. We could build someone a house, and we say, now, is the paper around? I'll take my picture. I'm going to make sure this gets in the newspaper. You just avoided everything you just did. Call the reporter. We want to make sure they see this. You just ruined it. The Bible tells us we should do things so that our left hand doesn't know what our right hand is doing. Right? It means you do things if you get the glory for it. Someone says, good job, fine, but what? It doesn't matter. Selfish, ungodly, worldly people worry about that kind of stuff. Christians do not worry about those types of things. Great acts done with selfish motives are worthless. What the Christian does and how the Christian lives should be done because of godly motivation. God receives the glory. God is the one who gives us the blessings and make those things happen anyway. As we saw in Ephesians 2 verse 10, we are created in Him for good works. We are His workmanship, therefore what? He should get the glory. We get the reward though, don't we? We get eternal life with God with Christ, and with all the faithful. Give God the glory, and He'll give you the true reward. Do it with righteous motives. Do it with godly intentions. Giving God the glory, and He'll give you the reward. You know, we find that throughout the Sermon on the Mount there in Matthew chapter 5. What you do in secret, what God will reward you openly, right? That means we will receive the true reward, that is eternal life. You know, we think about godly motivation. We know there are those today who do things from impure points. They do things for impure reasons. That is, they're not doing it really for the right reason. We want to make sure that as a New Testament Christian, that God always gets the glory. That we make sure we do things for righteous reasons, not for selfishness. That we make sure that He is the one at the forefront of our lives, not just on the Lord's Day, but every day. And that when we make mistakes, as we know we will, because we are not perfect people, we can repent of our sins, confess those things to God, as we find in 1 John chapter 2, He will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have to take the steps to make sure that we are in the body of Christ. The Bible also tells us we must hear the Word of God, doesn't it? We don't obey what we have not heard. We hear the Word of God. And based on hearing the Word of God, we believe, we become convinced that Christ is the Son of God. We find that in Acts chapter 2, don't we? We then repent of our sins because we have lived, in the, lived a life that is in contradiction to what Christ and what God desires from us, as we find again in Acts chapter 2. We confess that Christ is the Son of God, as we find again by Saul in the book of Acts. And then what do we do? We are immersed for the, for the remission of our sins, as we find again in Acts chapter 2. And our sins are washed away by the blood of Christ, as we see in Galatians 3, verse 27, it's at that moment that we are placed into the body of Christ. 
And then we must remain faithful, living a life that is filled with godly motivation for all that we do. This morning, as you think about these things, we can help you or encourage you in any way. You can come forward now. Just can we stand and sing the song that's been selected?